So I would like to welcome everybody to our team operations. Following our presentation today, we will be sharing a reg link for a hands-on workshop um, dedicated to this particular topic that will be this Friday. So please stay on until the end so we can share the registration link with you. Daniel, could you flip over please to the next slide? So we have a couple of housekeeping items up front. Um, please note this call is being recorded. Um, you're all in this and only mode. If you would like to ask any questions, please use the Q&A panel and we will address those at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker today, Daniel Lizio Katzen. He's head of strategy and partnerships here at Riffworks. There's also a quick bio on him if you would like to read that briefly and his Twitter handle and email address as well. And then uh, without further ado, I will hand it over to him. Please, Daniel, take it away. Absolutely. Thank you all for joining this afternoon. And don't worry, even though I uh, lead partnerships today, I actually started out life as a developer and have run decent size engineering and product teams uh, over the past 15, 20 years. So uh, hopefully I have a little, a little experience with this whole DevOps and now GitOps thing that we're going to discuss today. First, I'd like to talk a little bit about Weaveworks. So hopefully you've heard of us before and that's why you're here, but Weaveworks is six years old this year. We were started in 2014 by Alexis Richardson uh, as well as Matthias Radstock. Um, one of the nice and kind of neat things from my point of view is prior to starting Weaveworks, Alexis and Mateus actually created RabbitMQ. So they've been uh, seeped in what we now call cloud native technologies and we used to just call cloud technologies. Today, Weaveworks has over 70 employees spread across the globe. Um, in the US, we have three offices in the Bay Area, in Colorado Springs, and in New York City. And then we are headquartered in London. We also have an office in Berlin and offices in uh, India and Australia. So some of our customers that you can see up there, those are the big shiny logos. Um, one of the ones we'll be talking about today is Fidelity as well as NatWest. We do a lot of business in the financial services industry and we'll talk about why GitOps is a great fit there and for other regulated industries. Uh, in addition to our great customer base, we also have some pretty uh, interesting investors, I'd say, in addition to Excel and Redline on the VC front, we have both Google Ventures and Amazon as investors, as well as Ericsson as a strategic investor. So one of the things that you may know Weaveworks for is our open source projects. And what's pretty cool from my point of view about our open source projects is that many of them grew out of our need to operate a very large production SaaS platform called WeaveCloud on top of Kubernetes. And so as we were very, very early to the Kubernetes space, we ran into a lot of issues trying to get our SaaS to actually work on top of Kubernetes in a production stable fashion. As such, we started developing a bunch of tools. Um, one of the first tools we built was something called Scope. Scope is a pod visualization and cluster visualization tool. It's been actually downloaded over a billion times. So it's a, it's a fun, fun package to play around with. Um, another tool that we build is Cortex, which is a enterprise multi-tenant distribution of Prometheus. In addition to Cortex, which is part of the CNCF now, and uh, Scope, we have almost a dozen other open source packages. Today, we're really going to be focused on Flux, which we call the GitOps operator and flagger as we go through these. But if you are uh, an open source contributor or interested in any of these projects, they can be found on GitHub and they are true open source. So we welcome contributions and we welcome questions about the projects too. I'm not an expert on, uh, on many or any of them really, but I can certainly talk about most. So the first thing we want to dive into today is what is DevOps? And DevOps is an interesting term because I think it's been adopted very, very quickly across the industry over the past few years, but it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So if you ask an operator what it is, they're going to give you one answer. If you ask a developer what it is, they're going to give you another. Um, so if we look at the Wikipedia definition. It's a set of practices that combine software development and IT operations with the goal of shortening how long it takes to get code to production, um, ideally using continuous integra integration and continuous deployment. Now, saying that, it's really, really important from my standpoint to remember that the goal of DevOps is to ship code faster with fewer de 
defects. Like that's, that's our net goal. Ideally, we want to do that by removing obstacles from both developers and improving the process for which operators can actually control that. So we're going to talk about that today. So some of the core DevOps questions that we go through, you know, what does DevOps success look like and how do we get there? What does an optimal developer experience look like? Meaning what removes most of the barriers for developers so that they can move as quickly as possible, but hopefully not break things. What does an optimal operations experience look like, right? Do I have to depend on that legacy ticketing environment? Can we make things move more quickly? Can we have more human friendly interactions uh, with our coworkers? And then how do we get developers and operations to collaborate? And frequently what ends up happening is we start with this idea of dev and ops in different silos. Um, in an ideal kind of top-down approach, your, your business leaders say, hey, we want DevOps, so we want to push you guys together. You guys have to collaborate. Um, but depending on the size, the age of um, some of the regulatory hurdles that organizations have in place, frequently it's hard to make the cultural changes to get this to happen. So sometimes we can get to something, especially in a containerized environment, that looks a little bit like this, where we've got dev, we've got DevOps that kind of bridges between development and operations, where operations is providing a stable, consistent operational layer, which developers can utilize according to policy and permissions. And that's the goal that we're gonna be talking about today and how to get there truly with GitOps. So one of the things that I like to do, and especially as a product guy and also as a developer, is I like to, to measure things because you can't manage what you can't measure. So before we dive in, let's look at some of the metrics that are super important to actually seeing if we're successful on our DevOps journey. One is, you know, the number one goal, deployment or cycle time, meaning how quickly can we actually get the code that I'm writing as a developer checked in and deployed to an environment? Right, that can be to the dev environment, integration, QA, staging, production. Every company has a different set of environments they need to deploy code to and a different type of uh, process to manage promotions. We're gonna talk about how we can streamline some of those, but also, you know, how do we measure the reduction in deployment time? Because that's a key KPI. The second is deployment frequency. So if anyone here is over, you know, has been in the industry for more than 10 to 15 years, you've probably come across uh, waterfall development methodology or even um, what I'd kind of call bastardized agile, which is uh, sometimes called agile iterative. And what that can mean is that you have um, biweekly sprints or even weekly sprints, but the output of that sprint is not shipping code in a release. The output of that sprint is just moving on to another sprint. And if that's the case and you're, you're operating from um, a waterfall or kind of an agile iterative standpoint, then increase in deployment frequency can actually maybe be the number one goal here where you're really trying to get builds to a certain environment much, much faster. So deployment frequency is super important to measure. Change lead time, right? So this means like deployment frequency, how quickly your development process and how well your teams work together, right? So sometimes what I think about here is my product development life cycle as opposed to my software development life cycle. What that means is from the time the product development organization, or if you have a customer uh, driven, let's say defect, how quickly it takes to write that user story up or log that defect and get that shipped to an environment. Then we have the change failure rate. This focuses on the number of successful deployments versus the number of unsuccessful deployments. It's great if you're deploying much more frequently, but if you're having a lot more failures, then there's typically a breakdown in your tests, maybe not enough test coverage, maybe um, there's something wrong with your deployment strategies, maybe uh, your environments are very inconsistent. And the last one has the, the biggest acronym, which usually means um, that it's complicated. So the mean time to recovery, this means how much time does it take to recover from a failure? So this is typically measured by rollbacks or roll forwards, depending on um, how sophisticated your, your database replication is. So again, it's super important to develop these common DevOps metrics so that you can measure how successful 
your journey is, right? It, remember, if you're able to reduce the amount of time it takes a developer to ship code, you can actually quantify that in terms of the number of additional, whether it's points that are uh, added to a sprint, then the additional work that's done over the course of the year because people are not spending time waiting. So let's talk about some of the pros and cons of DevOps because it, it's not necessarily a panacea. So some of the pros, which we've touched on quickly, faster deployments, rapid delivery. So this goes to patch fixes and things like that. Ideally reduced complexity, increased reliability, increased ability to scale, and improved collaboration. Now these are all if your process works well. But some of the cons that can run into on, on the DevOps side of things, you can run into developer fatigue. If you're always shipping and you don't have a good process for controlling how code is promoted between environments, that can lead to a, a lot of emails, a lot of slacks, a lot of additional work if there's not a good process in place. It can be a lack of talent. If you're in a large organization that's used to uh, an older way of shipping software and kind of standardized release process, you know, you may not have the folks that are able to um, really appreciate and move forward the new set of DevOps processes that are needed. You can suffer from too many tools. Um, I don't know if anyone has had this experience, but I know I have. Uh, you end up with things like uh, Ansible, Puppet, and Chef all being used in the same organization. Um, maybe all in the same set of infrastructure. And what can happen very, very quickly, especially in this new kind of cloud native open source environment that we live in, is you can end up with each team having a set of tools that they use to promote and ship code. So your CI CD process is not standardized. It ends up being different for many parts of your organization. And that can actually slow things down if you like to have um, people move between teams uh, several times a year, or if you have um, auditing like, SO, uh, like SOC 2 requirements, having a lot of different tools to justify and talk about can actually really slow down the, uh, the process. Next one is kind of my uh, favorite analogy, scripts as pets. So you may have done a very good job of writing scripts so that your environments are stood up in the proper order with the proper um, set of tools and the proper services installed. But if one thing changes, let's say an API for your cloud service provider um, goes from version two to version three, that may break all of your scripts. And that's because the script is a pet. It is a, a unique, nice little piece of code that works very, very specifically in a specific configuration, but is also very brittle and breaks quickly. Organizational issues. So again, DevOps is great on paper, but if we go back to those little bubbles, if your teams are not used to working together, then it can actually uh, break down pretty quickly with a lot of finger pointing. And then the final issue, which we'll talk a little bit more about, is security. So security is something that a lot of folks focus on from a developer standpoint and from an operation standpoint, but a poorly implemented DevOps process can also cause a breakdown in security. And this, this especially happens on your continuous integration and continuous deployment side. The tooling that's necessary to actually push that code directly into each environment by its nature, it needs to have access to those environments. It needs to have a pretty hefty set of permissions. And because of that, it is um, one attack vector that people with uh, not nice intentions can pursue. And so security can be an issue with DevOps. And we're gonna talk a little bit why about why GitOps can help remediate some of these different cons of DevOps and really uh, get us to a much more manageable DevOps process. So Kelsey Hightower, who uh, actually works at Google and is a big proponent of all things function as service or sometimes known as serverless, uh, put this up in Twitter a little while ago and, and we think it's very uh, apropos. GitOps is the best thing since configuration as code. Git changed how we collaborate, but declarative configuration is the key to dealing with infrastructure at scale and sets the stage for the next generation of management tools. So we like to think he was talking about Flux, which is one of our uh, tools that we'll touch on in a sec. But what this does bring us to is the principles of GitOps. Uh, 
So when we talk about the principles of GitOps, and, and many people, and I'll pause just for a second here, think, oh, I'm doing infrastructure as code. I've got all of the configuration for each of my environments already stored in Git, therefore I'm doing GitOps. That's not exactly true. Because as we can see from the principles of GitOps, and really the first principle of GitOps is that the entire system is described declaratively. What I want to pause on just for a second is an explanation that I like uh, that I dug up on Stack Exchange for the difference between imperative and declarative. And so this is a very, very, very important thing to think about when you're thinking about Kubernetes and other sets of declarative infrastructure. So the simplest explanation that I've seen is uh, if you've got two customers that are going to a restaurant. So Imperative goes to a restaurant and orders a steak cooked rare, fries with ketchup, a side salad with ranch, and a Coke. The waiter delivers exactly what he asked for and is charged $14.50. It's a pretty cheap steak. Uh, on the other hand, Declarative goes to the restaurant, tells the waiter that he only wants to pay around $12 for dinner, and he's in the mood for steak. The waiter returns with a steak, a side of mashed potatoes, steamed broccoli, a dinner roll, and a glass of water and he's charged $11.99. And so to put this another way, with imperative infrastructure, you describe exactly what you want and you only get exactly what you described. With declarative infrastructure, you're telling the orchestration environment, in the case uh, that we're talking about right now, Kubernetes, what you would like to happen. You're declaring that you want a system, a set of infrastructure that does X, Y, and Z, and you're doing that with YAML. And then Kubernetes is, is providing you with the infrastructure that matches what you declared. So one of the key principles of GitOps is you're declaring your infrastructure. You are not uh, imperatively describing your infrastructure. It's really, really, really important to remember that difference. The next principle is that the canonical desired system state is versioned in Git. So what this means is your configuration, your declaratively described configuration is stored in Git and specifically in a Git repo. What this means is that actually you are controlling what your infrastructure looks like from Git. Users are never logging into a cluster and manually changing the configuration. What we're really doing is we're going in and we're making the change through a pull request in your Git repository. So it doesn't matter if you're using GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, or some other Git um, code versioning system. What matters is that it is versioned in Git. And this is really, really important, so I'm gonna say it one more time. With GitOps, you are never changing the configuration in the cluster directly through your own login. It's only happening through a pull request in Git. This is, a, this is a key principle because one of the things that this gives us is a very, very, very well understood, well documented, and loved by auditors audit trail. You're getting everything that is great about Git with your infrastructure. The next step is that approved changes are automatically applied to the system. So really what this means is after that pull request is merged into the appropriate branch in Git, those changes are automatically applied to the system. There's no additional human intervention. So what this means is the process, the permissions, the policy that is already described in your Git code versioning repository is now applying to your infrastructure. So as soon as that pull request is merged, boom, it is pushed live into your cluster. And the final principle is software agents ensure correctness and alert between, that means they're doing differentials and actions on the cluster. So in this case, we're talking about Flux um, or Argo. And so what Flux will actually do is it is running in your Kubernetes cluster. It is looking at the Git repo where the configuration for that cluster is, is warehoused. And it's looking at the configuration of the cluster. As soon as there's a difference or a drift between what's running and what's described in Git, it can do a bunch of different things. One of the things it can do is it can alert you to that difference. Another thing it can do is it can blow away the cluster and reprovision another one. So that's one of the really, really cool things about running proper GitOps is that you know that your infrastructure is only 
going to look like exactly what is checked into Git. So when we start to look at the benefits of GitOps, we can see that if we know that our infrastructure is always going to look like the configuration that's checked into Git and that we trust Git and our auditors trust it, Git and our security team and our CISO all trust Git, this automatically takes a lot of compliance weight off of our plate. And so what we have is a nice audited and secure continuous deployment. Right. We know that what is checked in is what's going to be running in the cluster. We can prove that through the audit logs. We can prove that through the alerts and everything else that are happening through Flux. So to that point, we also get monitoring and drift alerts. Again, when you're using some older infrastructure as code systems, and this could be something like Terraform or you know, Ansible, what you can do is you can automatically deploy your configuration. So it's going to deploy your Kubernetes cluster but it's not necessarily going to tell you that it's running correctly. And it's certainly not gonna alert you to the fact that if the running Kubernetes cluster's configuration changes and it does not um, equal what is living in Git, you don't actually know. So that means that there's a lot of additional overhead that needs to be done to actually continually monitor something using a non-GitOps process. The final benefit is the scalable software management. So we're talking about one environment looking at one Git repo, but there's no reason that a single environment has to look at, a, has to look at one Git repo. You can have multiple environments looking at a single Git repo. So let's imagine that you are an operations department for a large multinational bank you may have different data requirements in each jurisdiction that you operate within. So what you can have is you can have a configuration for Kubernetes clusters that is all based off of one master, but have different forks for different jurisdictions so that you have different rules for each of those jurisdictions. That means that each cluster that's in an appropriate geo, so let's say that you have a data center running in Germany, you have a data center running in the UK, you have a data center running in the United States, each of those geo, geogra geographic locations can actually have their own configuration, but it can be n number of clusters within each of those geographic uh, vicinities, meaning you can have multiple clusters all pointing at the same repo and maintaining the exact same configuration. So if we walk through this, in terms of GitOps on Kubernetes, we can go step by step. Let me just take a quick drink of water. So first, the entire system is described declaratively. So that means you're, doing, you're putting that configuration in Git. Second, the desired system state is versioned. So because we all know and love Git, and that's why we call it GitOps, we know that every single time we do a PR, we're getting a new version in Git. Approved changes to the desired state are automatically applied to the system. Again, this is a, the key principle, right? It's not that we are pushing it to Git and then nothing happens. We're pushing the pull request to Git, the merge happens and it's automatically deployed, right? So you're only making changes to the infrastructure through PRs. This is like a very, very, very key principle. And the last is that there's software agents to ensure correctness and alert on divergence. So again, we said this is Flux or it could be Argo. Those are the two primary tools used out there in the, the GitOps um, ecosystem today. But there, I'm sure, will be others in the future. And finally, we can look at what the operating model looks like. So here we have um, the left side and the right side. So we've got continuous integration and then Kubernetes GitOps. And we can think of this a little bit like the software development lifecycle on the left and the operational cluster lifecycle on the right. So if you do software development, you know that you, you build, you test, and then you, do, you deploy. And you build and you test, you deploy. You build and you test and you deploy. Now one of the f very, uh, I'd say, good things about GitOps is it's taking that standardized SDLC that most developers understand and have been practicing for almost a decade at this point, and it's starting to apply the same principle to operations. So now when you hit that deploy 
you can actually deploy your code to a fully configured Kubernetes cluster, whether that's running in Amazon EKS, whether that's running on your own, your own on-prem infrastructure or AKS or GKE, you can simply schedule that deployment to happen when a pull request from your code base hits a certain branch. So that can be a merge to a feature branch, it can be a merge to master, it can be a merge um, to somebody's fork. It all depends on how you have configured your environment and what your promotions look like, right? So you're starting to make a real DevOps path between your infrastructure and your actual a software development life cycle. And just as it has been for software for quite some time, Git is the single source of truth for your system's desired state, right? So all intended operations are committed by pull request. All diffs or differentials between intended and observed state are have automatic convergence. And all changes are observable, verifiable, and auditable, which is uh, very, very nice if you're working, as I mentioned, in a industry with a lot of regulations and compliance hurdles. So talking about one of those industries, we have a fun use case to talk about with um, a new product that has been put forth by uh, NatWest Bank over in the UK called Metal, which is a business uh, checking account. And one of their uh, principal uh, operations, platform operations folks, Steve Wade, recently gave a talk with us and about why they chose Flux continuous deployment um, for the platform team. And one of the things that they really wanted to do was they wanted to bring down the time, amount of time that it took to get code deployed. And at the same time, they wanted to reduce the security attack vectors that were caused by having um, Concourse CI uh, basically pulling some of their key security keys and other um, necessary credentials for, for pushing changes out to their environments out of Git. And so what they were able to realize is they were able to increase their deployment speed by 50%. They were able to increase their deployment frequency by 65%. And then their developers were actually able to spend almost 75% more time coding. And, and that last one is really, really key, because if you think about how much time as a developer it takes after you push code and you're waiting for your merge, and now the tests need to run, and now you're waiting for the environment to be built if the environment's not built, it, it can be days to have a new environment built, um, especially if it was inadvertently blown away or there was um, an issue with the first environment that was built. So by moving to a GitOps, um, CD pipeline, what, they, what the team was able to do was upon code check-in, the tests run, as soon as the tests hit green, that code is automatically deployed to a brand new cluster that is configured in exactly the fashion that operations envisioned. And that's all happening in an automated fashion. The only thing that needs to be manually done is the merge. And so what this means is when you're looking at a multi-stage uh, environment pipeline where you have the dev environment, an integration environment, a QA environment, staging, and then production, you're able to get code all the way to QA with very, very little human intervention other than on the developer side, just the merge of that pull request. And so what this does is it means there's less time spent wasting, wasted time waiting, and more time spent building software. And I see that there's a a question that popped up while we were going through this about the typical RBAC model for uh, Git for this to work. And so typically what we see, and, and I probably need to clarify this a little bit, is the developers still have their Git repos, right? Their code and their software development lifecycle works in the same fashion that it has been working in, meaning they're going through, they're building their code, they've got their product pipeline, they're doing Agile or they're doing Scrum or Squads and they've got some sort of uh, software development methodology that they're following. When the code gets to the place where it needs to be merged and built to not their local environment, so typically this is your dev integration or even your QA environment, that's the point where GitOps really kicks off. So if we back up one, one slide, at the point that the code is checked in, the tests are run, 
it's merged and let's say the deployment target is dev integration, it's automatically going to pick up from a separate repo. And this is the repository that is supervised and owned by the operations team. It's gonna pick up the configuration that applies to the Kubernetes clusters that are deployed in that dev integration environment. So this, uh, I, the best way to think about GitOps is really to think about it as the marriage between the software development lifecycle and the operations infrastructure as code lifecycle, right? So when we start talking about the RBAC model for this, the developers keep that permissioning and the role-based um, access that they already have for the developer side to get. The operations teams do the same thing for the configuration and the cluster configuration. And what that means is that the operations teams do not need to give the developers access to the actual um, edit or write access to the Git repo where those configuration is. What they're doing is giving them access to just read and deploy from that repository. And so the nice thing is, is that you keep very strict are back or very strict policy um, and permissions across your Git repos, you're really just enabling read access. And you're not necessarily enabling read access for all uh, infrastructure repositories. So for instance, developers may be able to read the entire configuration for dev integration. Uh, they may be able to read the entire configuration for the QA environment. They may not be able to read the entire config for the staging environment and they probably should never get to look at the configuration for the production environment. And the reason that is, is that there may be slight differences between the configuration for each of those environments that the developers don't necessarily need access to, especially in a very regulated fashion to um, be able to build their software and run their tests. So jumping back down here, um, one other thing that I just want to stress is that the real goal of DevOps and, and GitOps by its nature is to enable teams, both operations teams and development teams to work more efficiently, to build code faster, and to focus on what they're, they really should be doing, which is building business value through whatever proprietary um, software is gonna work really well for that company it's not necessarily a very strategic thing to do to have, let's say, uh, the developers at a bank really spending a ton of time figuring out how to operate, how to manage, how to configure Kubernetes. What is a much better use of time is having those developers and taking down all barriers for those developers to build and ship code so that those developers can be confident that every single time they run their tests, regardless of the environment, it's gonna, they're gonna run in the exact same fashion. So we really focus on trying to enable developers to move faster, to increase velocity, and for the operations teams and the development teams to work directly together. So why should we care? So some of the benefits of GitOps, and one that I did not mention yet, is something that it really helps to do, is trivialize rollbacks. What this means, because you always know exactly what code and exactly what version of code is being used to configure your clusters, if you need to roll it back because it's not working, you can very easily, in Git, roll back to the previous version. The second is exceptional auditing and attribution. And to that question earlier, assuming you've secured your Git repositories properly. You know, if you have not followed best practices in terms of your policies and permissions around your Git repositories, um, well, then, then you need to do that first. There's a separation of concerns. Now, the idea with DevOps is developers get to do more operations, but there still needs to be a separation of providing that infrastructure that works in a consistent fashion and then letting developers self-service clusters that are created in an identical fashion each time. There's no crossing of those security boundaries with properly laid out permissions like I described before, some repositories hold your infrastructure code, some repositories hold your software code. Those repositories don't necessarily need to be shared, and they probably shouldn't be. And secondly, they don't even need to be in the same Git system. You could have your operations team using Bitbucket and your developers using GitHub. Now, that's not necessary at all. You can get those same uh, 
boundaries through projects and lots of other things using the same systems. But if you were really, really, really paranoid, you could have people using completely different software and it would all work. Process and constraints enforcement. Going back to what we just talked about with policy and permissions, it's very, very easy and it's very auditable to see how those processes work and then how the constraints are enforced. It's a good, if not great, software and human collaboration point. Git is known and loved by many, many users across the world here at this point. And so it's a good place for everybody to interface and look at how these processes are being managed and how they run. And then it's easy to validate for correctness and the systems can self heal. If you know what the configuration should look like and you know that a configuration or a cluster is misbehaving, you can set a policy and you can do a little programming so that the cluster automatically is terminated and a cluster is reprovisioned. This is one of the nice things about Kubernetes and GitOps when they're paired together. So as I mentioned a little bit up front, Weaveworks has quite a few different open source initiatives that we've created over the past six years to help us operate Weave Cloud, um, our SaaS kind of Kubernetes platform. What we've actually spent the last year doing is really working on uh, the new version uh, of Weave Cloud. And this is we're calling Weave Kubernetes Platform, and it actually can be run inside your own cluster. This can run on Amazon EKS, can run on Google GKE, can run on uh, Amazon or Azure AKS, and it can run on uh, pretty much every single version of Kubernetes out there, including OpenShift, Rancher, PKS, you, you pick it. And what it does is it provides a Kubernetes application platform. So what this means in English is you can view all of your clusters, regardless of where they're running, from one control plane. It manages the clusters and the applications running across those different clusters, and it builds in GitOps and other enterprise features. So it brings in the policy, the lifecycle management, and it uses GitOps to manage each one of those clusters. Then finally, it can define clusters and components using a model-based system. So what this means, if we go back to what we described earlier about having different configuration for different environments or different geographic vicinities, um, you can actually use WKP to create standardized models that are deploying not just the configuration of those Kubernetes clusters appropriately in each environment, but also the set of services that are needed by the applications in each of those environments. So it really uh, reduces the amount of time it takes to manage very large sets of infrastructure. And it can deploy new clusters using those definitions. And finally, has alerting and operations built in. So that's about it for our presentation today. So thank you everybody for attending today. If you have any questions or if you wanna get um, some of this information in white paper format, you can check out the links up here on the page or you can reach out to me on Twitter at DJLK or DJLK at weave.works. We also, if you're playing around with our open source software, have a very well-staffed community Slack. It's the best place to get your, your questions about Flux or Flagger or any of our open source initiatives answered. And that's at weave-community.slack.com. Thank you everybody for attending today and have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Thanks so much.